Hi everyone, this is Grace, and today I'll be walking you through this most epic ornament set. I mean, 29 designs. Ah, amazing. But <laughs> there are a couple of things that I did to this tutorial to kind of streamline it, shorten it a little bit, because y'all, 29 cookies is a lot of cookies. So first of all, I ordered this by color, so it is hopefully a little easier to find a specific ornament because I don't really have names for all of them. <laughs> I don't know how I would. Um, and second of all, I have taken out any floods after this one. So we're going to see the flood situation with this cookie. Um, and then I'm going to skip past that for the rest of them because I like to be able to talk through the whole thing. And there only, there's only so much I can say through a flood. <laughs> So also it's repeat motion. And I think what's most important is what's going on top, right? So let's talk about this. This entire set is a two consistency outline and flood. Oh, and sidebar. I'm definitely going to be doing this in a couple of goes. <laughs> so just prepare for that. Um, yeah, because it's two hours and 17 minutes. We can do this. It was even longer before I took out the floods. Anyway, focus grace. So Two consistency outline and flood. This whole set is a soft peak piping consistency to outline. Let that crust. And then, well, actually in my videos, you probably won't see it crust because I'm impatient, but I would not recommend that for a beginner. Um, let it crust because that's going to really hold the icing in better than when it's still wet. And then I was going to say something else. What was I going to say? Oh, oh, the flood is a thin flood. Uh, I tried to make it an extra thin flood, but I don't think I actually succeeded because I feel like with some of the um, extensive wet on wet, it still felt like it crusted too fast. But anyway, I digress. So um, this is just a simple addition on the top here with these lines. Um... I am naturally, I was going to say I'm naturally good at piping lines. I have a very steady hand. Um, and so I know a lot of people really struggle with not steady hands. So I don't have a ton of advice, but a few crucial things to have nice straight lines. First of all, brace your piping hand, piping arm on the table. So I sometimes put my elbow, sometimes I put like, just above my elbow on the edge of the table. Um, then what do I do? Okay. Um, I do not brace my decorating hand, but you certainly can if you want, if you feel like you need it. So I recommend taking your pointer finger and your middle finger of your opposite hand. And depending on the size of your bag, you can either brace the bag itself if you're working with a much larger bag, or you can just brace the palm of your hand. Um, so you have extra stability. Now, this is not an indicator of your skill level. I know a couple of expert advanced cookiers who pipe that way. I just personally do not like to. I didn't learn that way, I think. So it's not how I pipe. <laughs> um, I'm doing the topper here, which I agonized over what kind of topper I should do for the set until I realized, you know what, Grace, they can just all be different. So I don't know. There are at least three or four different kinds of toppers. Um, this is one where I did like this little scallop thing, but all um, pressure piped, which I later discovered I didn't love. <laughs> so I switched that up. Um, this design originally just had the lines and I was like, it needs something else. It needs something else. So I have this recurring holly theme. Um, oh shoot. What's the word for that? Oh my goodness. I've used that before in my videos before. <gasps> Motif. Thank you, Grace. <laughs> um, so there's a recurring holly theme recurring themes, I believe the definition of that is the definition of a motif. Okay. Um, and I guess I could have cut this out too, but there's a lot of boring, um, painting of all of the toppers. And what am I doing? Okay. So I'm using the sugar art sterling pearl in wedding gold to paint the topper. 
And someone asked me, like, why bother making the topper a different color if you're just going to paint it gold? Like, why not just do it in the color of the cookie? The reason for that is this is a totally edible luster dust, which doesn't have the best coverage. I mean, it's good coverage for edible luster dust, don't get me wrong. Um, but if you've ever tried the not edible stuff... <laughs> That does have incredible coverage. This needs a little help. So if I were trying to paint gold on top of this dark red or green um, or blue, it has to work extra hard just to get, just to cover um, those colors. So yeah, I mean, I what would have been even better is to actually use a golden yellow of some sort, but... I did not make that for the set and I wasn't going to make that just for the toppers. So here we are. But it probably would have made an even richer gold in the end if I had done that. So just keep that in mind. All right. This cookie here um, was actually inspired by... Oh uh, my goodness. Brain fart. Oh my goodness. What was it inspired by, Grace? Um... Wow, it was a previous set that I did for a holiday. I am Lunar New Year. Wow, massive brain fart. Okay, I did something kind of similar to this, like this kind of line scalloped action thing um, for one of the cookies I did for Lunar New Year. So that inspired this. And I love doing line work in the same color. I just think it's so classy. So you'll see here what's important is that I am picking up the icing off the surface of the cookie. That's another important thing for good line work. So not only do you want to make sure you brace your arm on the table, brace your decorating hand if you need to, but you have to lift your bag off the surface of the cookie. And how much you lift your bag is just going to depend on really how long the line is. So obviously these are pretty short lines, so I'm not lifting very far, but you can see that I'm lifting them. And in the end, this gives me total like art deco vibes, which I love. And something you'll see me do here, you see I'm like cutting off the very end of the line. And that's because um, it just leaves a little too much icing on the end. I'm not making any sense right now. <laughs> like I like to have <coughs> excuse me uh, I don't know where that came from um I like to have oh like a seamless waterfall effect off the side of the cookie um and depending on the angle sometimes I can kind of do that with the tip of the bag and if I can't do it with the tip of the bag then I'll use that specific metal scribe you see the PME one because that's my smallest like finest scribe and I'll use that to just whoop, chop off the ends. Gorgeous. Now, obviously, I freehanded this because I'm just freehanding queen. <laughs> That's my usual MO. But you could, um, if you want to mark this off at all, I would recommend using that PME scribe and actually poking holes in the surface of the crusted icing. It can be a little scary at first, um, but be gentle and it can work if you want to like mark off. But Y'all, ha who has time for that? Now, I originally was only going to do those scallops, and then I looked at it and I was like, I feel like it needs something. So I decided to add these dots. And I am using a soft peak piping consistency. That is what I definitely recommend for line work. It's definitely the easiest. There is like the rare, rare type of line work that I can't think of right now at the top of my head that you would need like a medium peak for, but generally soft peak all the way. So then I piped the dots and I looked at it and I was like, I feel like it still needs something else. This is also a different topper. So we've got two different options already. And 
what sold me on doing different toppers is one of the reasons I make these shape series sets is I want to provide inspiration to do this kind of cookie, this kind of design in a bajillion different ways. Like the sky is the limit. So why limit myself to just one topper? <laughs> Let me give you different ideas. Okay. So I looked at this cookie and I was like, it needs, it needs some gold. So I decided to paint the dots, not original, not my original plan. Obviously the dots were not even part of it. I might have considered actually painting all of the lines at one point, which is totally a look too. That would look great, but I like the dots. Simple. Art Deco. Love it. Okay. This is one of my favorites. I mean, so many of these are my favorites. So I'm probably just going to say that over and over again, but that's fine. Um, this gorgeous burgundy red to start. And we let that crest. And then we're doing this snowfall effect, which I did not come up with. I've seen this on many a ornament design. And the burgundy red, so the colors that I used here are mostly the Sugar Art Master Elites. So the red is the burgundy. Um, I think I used that as pure burgundy. But if you want it to be like a brighter red, you can add some of their red rose to it to give it a little more life. Um, the green is not a master elite. The blue is the blueberry master elite. I love that one. Um, the green, I'm fairly certain. How did I make that? <laughs> um, Americolor royal blue mixed with, I don't know, lemon yellow, egg yellow. Um, very saturated. I probably added a touch of black to it. I tend to do that when I'm trying to make darker colors. For both the red and the green, um, I just added, I made a little extra of the dark and I added like a spoonful of the dark color to a bowl of fresh icing to make the pink and the lighter green. <clears throat> so the green is definitely on the bluer side of green, which is why the lighter version is kind of like a mint green, which is exactly what I was going for. And then the blue, I just made blue. And then I had very intentionally made this off white, which you could agree with, disagree with, whatever. <laughs> but I wanted this set to be a little softer. Um, I didn't want a bright white. So sidebar, I'll talk about the white in a second. <coughs> Sorry, I don't know why I keep coughing. All right. Um, so these little snow blobs, I'm letting those dry. And I felt like it needed more. <laughs> I don't know that I was planning to do those dots before. I don't really know. I was kind of, I was flowing. I felt like I needed to fill in some space, which is why I'm adding these red dots, which I don't think was my original plan. And you want to let the little white blobs dry because then when they're dry, you can take a paintbrush and actually like, um, brush off the excess sanding sugar. So this is my favorite sanding sugar that I don't think is made before. <laughs> made still, which makes me really sad. Um, it's Wilton small sanding sugar. If you Google like Wilton sanding sugar, you're just going to find the big stuff that they still make. This is my favorite small sanding sugar because it's like the shiniest and sparkliest of all of them. Oh, I'm going to be so sad when I run out of this. Okay. Um, so you can see what I'm doing here. Only do this when those white dots are dry because otherwise you're going to like brush off the icing. And then obviously I had a little, had a little, had to add a little holly detail because I was feeling the holly y'all. Obviously. Now when I am filming 
I try to move the cookie as little as possible. So if you see me move the cookie, that's because I really needed it moved for the angle of whatever I'm piping. And that left side of the holly, I just cannot do <laughs> right handed at the correct angle. Because you really want to come at the holly at a 45 degree head on angle, if that makes any sense. Mm, chef's kiss. Love that. All right, moving on to yet another red one. Now, I must admit, <laughs> um, I thought this was going to be more impressive than it was. I mean, my mother, don't get me wrong, my mother was very impressed by this one and it was one of her favorites. And I was like, really? Because for me, it's so simple. So I left in the flood because we are doing wet on wet. Um, it's always good to use a scribe to get like the really um, sharp corners or edges that you might have. All right. So a trick that I do when I'm doing wet on wet or like fine detail wet on wet is I actually use, I know this is annoying, but I will bag my flood in two different bags. I'll put it in a big bag for my actual flooding the surface. And then what you saw me use there and what you see me here use with the pink is actually a very small bag that's like one, maybe two ounces of icing, but you really only need like one. I'm just always afraid I'm going to run out. And then what that does by having two different bags is that I can cut a much smaller tip in the small bag to do fine detail stuff like this and then cut a much larger like normal flood tip in the other one. The smaller bag also gives you a lot more control. Um because there's less icing, like less pressure. One of the biggest mistakes a lot of people make, and I honestly still often make, is putting too much icing in your bags because you're going to have a lot less control when you have more icing, more weight. So just keep that in mind. Um, <laughs> these little hearts at the bottom really sealed the deal for me in giving total Valentine's Day vibes, which is fine. It's totally fine. There's nothing wrong with Valentine's Day vibes. I just, yeah. <laughs> I love my color palette as, as a unit, but when I, I probably, I should have added some green to this. Maybe like the light green would have been nice, but ship has sailed clearly. Um, all right. And this kind of topper, I did add a little squiggle in the middle to help prevent craters on that. This is a flood consistency that I'm putting in there. I love this topper. It might be my favorite one from the set. It's like very simple, but just super elegant, clean. Love that. <clears throat> this, oh, <clears throat> excuse me. Something else I can say about these cutters. Um, I actually worked with Amanda over at Brighton Cutters to come up with this um, ornament set. She does already have an ornament set, which is a bit more ornate than this one is. I wanted something that was a little simpler. And honestly, I'm quite obsessed. So if you want to look these up, I mean, they'll be linked in the description of the video, but it's just the Graceful Baker ornament set. <laughs> um, I tend to have a much like chubbier, simpler aesthetic to my designs. And so I wanted to come up with a few like simpler and kind of bigger, um, bigger ornament shapes. I believe these only come in one size. So if you buy them, they'll be the size that I used. Alrighty, next up we have the pink ornaments. So this pink color, I just took a spoonful of the burgundy, added that to white, and that's how I got this pink um, because I wanted it to be a true gradation of the burgundy. Um, this is a design that I've actually done before. I know if you've been around a minute, you know my heart shape series set. And I don't know, I'm just obsessed with this. I had to put it on, put it on an ornament, obviously. Um, <laughs> so here we are. All right. Now, 
what am I doing? Okay, what you didn't see me do is I took an edible marker and I obviously marked this off. Um, to be totally honest, <sighs> like, <laughs> again, I only did one of these. So I kind of wish that I had made the curve a bit more exaggerated, I think, at the start. Because as you can see, since I was trying to follow it, kind of like tapered off. I don't know. It's a look too. Um, but one and done. <laughs> Didn't have another go, which is fine. Uh, it's still beautiful. So I outlined that in a soft peak piping consistency. And then I'm going in here with soft peak again to do the little squiggles to prevent craters. And I do not like to let them dry. I like to go in immediately with my flood. And I'm just using my thin flood that I use for the rest of this set. And using my scribe to get it into all the little corners. And what's really important about this design to make it look really pretty and seamless is um, to make sure that you're getting it into all the little crevices because it's just one big uh, flooding in sections, <laughs> essentially, which means I'm flooding alternate sections so they can crust and then I can come back and do the one next to it. And I just personally, I mean, not, I think most people, like, <laughs> I can't get my piping bag to get to that tiny little corner. I feel like when I did this on the heart, I actually had, I want to say a smaller bag of icing, because this also requires a good amount of control with your flood. So if you're new to this especially, I would recommend um, actually having a smaller bag of flood for this so you can cut a smaller tip and you can have a lot more control. The bag that I'm using is much larger and the tip is much larger like it's a normal flood the entire cookie size tip which just requires more control. <laughs> That's all. But I managed to make it work y'all. And definitely the most nerve-wracking thing about this design is um What was I going to say? Total brain fart. Oh, uh, right. Because <laughs> if it craters, if these crater, it just kind of ruins the whole aesthetic, right? You're just going for like quilted, plush, poofy gorgeousness. So we're doing well so far. I let those crust. Um, for me, that's like at least 15 minutes. Sometimes I wait longer. Just depends on what else I'm working on in between. I do find with these squiggles, um, I don't want to get them all the way to the edge. I want to keep them really in the center. And then the way that I'm going to add these last sections is I'm pretty sure I'm just going to do a flood of the whole section. Let's see what I end up doing. What does Grace do? Am I? Am I? Yup. So it's a small enough space that I can just like squeeze the living daylights out of that <laughs> and just get a nice one and done um, kind of flood situation. That to me gets the best seam. The seam is what I refer to <clears throat> the two different sections next to each other. Um, yeah, how pretty, how pretty. What else can I say about this? <laughs> oh, real time can be so slow sometimes. Yeah, I just would not recommend doing this any other way. I mean, maybe if you had a tiny bag, you could do like two floods up each side. But again, I was rocking the big bag of icing, so that was not going to happen, <laughs> which is fine. My inspiration for this color scheme 
was I wanted something a little less traditional, a little more vintage, a little softer. So to me, the less traditional part is I added the navy blue and I did the pink. Um, I would say more and more, especially with cookies, like <laughs> pink's becoming a thing um, for Christmas. But when I think traditional, I just think red and green. Um, and for this, so I added the pink, I added the lighter green that's kind of minty, and that's like a softer addition. Um, I've had a lot of people, I think they're trying to <laughs> compliment it, but they've made comments like, this was so, what do they say? Like, coming in, like, wanting to hate the, the lighter, softer palette. Like, two of the five colors are lighter, softer. Okay, I also have off-white, but, like, most sets have white, so I don't really count that. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, that was something else with the softer, is I wanted to have the off-white um, instead of, like, a, a bright white like I normally do. You could pair this with a bright white, just not what I wanted to do, y'all. Most toppers um, have the actual, uh, what's it called, like indentation of the whole topper instead of what mine is. It's just like simplified. I don't, I don't know. Why did I do that? <laughs> I originally designed this thinking I was just going to have like one, I don't know. I don't really know what I was thinking. I, I, I thought I was going to do something different, but I didn't. I just ended up making like traditional toppers on top of the cookie and whatever. But it's, it's more of a free space. You can do whatever you want. You can just do like a wire on top. I'm going to quote unquote wire made with icing, obviously. Um, all right. This is another one that I'm like, is this Valentine's Day? Grace, what'd you do? Um, it's definitely the pink and the lack of green. <clears throat> giving me a little bit Valentine's Day vibes. But that's okay because this wet on wet plaid is so freaking satisfying. Now, I think I mentioned with this set, I did a thin flood. I think I tried to do my extra thin flood because I knew I wanted to give myself plenty of room to be able to do a lot of wet on wet if that's what I wanted. And I did do a lot of wet and wet. And I would say it was a pretty thin flood because I had a decent amount of time to work with it, but I could have done an even thinner flood because the thinner the flood, the longer it takes to crust. So the more time you have to work with it. And obviously topping it off with some edible glitter. Love me the edible glitter. And that's in the gold. I probably normally would have done the white diamond um, of the diamond dust from the sugar art. But since I was doing gold accents with this set, I wanted to keep it in the gold theme. <clears throat> And there we go. That's the nice plaid slash sort of Valentine's Day. <laughs> but that's okay. All right. Next up, I purely made this cookie um, because I just wanted to do more of the wreath design that I did with this set, which um, obviously I'm showing everything out of order. So I think, I think the white ones are last and I'll show you one of my favorites favorite cookies. Um, but I did this wreath technique. I did not come up with it, by the way. Uh, I've just seen other people do it. And I was skeptical, but it's so easy and it's so effective because you just do this zigzag. And I swear, the zigzag can look so messy 
it doesn't matter. It always turns out beautiful. Gorgeous. Now I like to do two greens with this. I didn't actually try it with just one green, but I would imagine, assume, you know, it still works with one. But I liked the different dimension of adding a second green to it and putting the lighter one on top because that's what you're going to see more of um, instead of the darker one, which I feel like would like overpower it because it, you know, it peeks through enough. And then the magic sauce, <laughs> I'm using my smallest scribe because um, the smaller the, the metal, the less it um, like pulls the icing. If it's thicker, it's obviously going to mess with it more. And this is a pretty small space, like small thing to be pulling. <laughs> um, so I wanted to have a minimal agitation of the icing. And then coming in with my little red berry dots and I just kind of alternate three, two, one, two, one, three, <laughs> just different groupings. Uh, you could probably do with less berries, but I love the berries so much, so much. So cute. And then, and then, and then, and then. I think we're going to top this off with a topper. Now this kind of design, <laughs> it takes a lot of self-control for me to not add something else to it because I always want to add more like a gold splatter or something. <laughs> and sometimes I have to ask my roommate and be like, um, does this need more? And she's usually like, no. She has much more of a simple aesthetic anyway. I find that with cookies, it is... It is deceiving how hard it is to do simple cookies because um, when it's super simple, when the design is simple, there's nothing you can hide behind. I, <laughs> nothing. Um, and sometimes less is more. Often less is more. And sometimes more is more. It just depends. Anyway. All right. We are rocking um, the, oh my God. A different kind of knit. This is like the traditional knit. We've already done the cable knit. Um, this is the, the sweater technique, lovingly called. And I am using a medium peak here. So when I do my shape series sets, um, I do have a plan that I've written down often with like inspiration photos or notes or whatever of the kinds of designs or techniques that I want to do on this set. And to give myself the most flexibility, I always prep three consistencies of every color, which is such a pain in the bumpkins, but it's worth it because then I can do a lot of different things. So like this is another cookie where I used three different consistencies. I outlined with a soft peak. I flood with my thin flood. I'm doing the sweater technique with a medium peak. And then um, these lines here I'm doing with a soft peak. And again, you need the medium peak for um, for the sweater technique because it needs a little extra extra help to hold its shape. Right? Okay, so what I'm doing here, this is a type of pressure piping which means that I'm varying the pressure on the bag as I'm piping. And what that technique is, is I'm essentially piping a dot. And then as I pull away, I'm simultaneously pulling towards the cookie and releasing pressure. So you're creating this um, tapered teardrop is kind of the way I describe it. So you pipe a dot, you pull away, you pull towards the cookie and you release pressure. So it's a lot harder <laughs> than it looks. Um, it's a lot of brain power to really focus on um, doing all those things at the same time. So satisfying to watch this. <laughs>
this is also like a very standard execution of this sweater knit. Um, a lot of people do this, like add one line, add two lines. Sometimes you can add three. Um, in this case, it wasn't that wide and I wanted to get as many in as I could. And to be totally honest, I did not plan this out. I didn't plan the widths out. And I think it worked perfectly because I was able to get an even five in, five of the knits. Very, very pleased with that. And this one, I really debated adding more gold to it. You're going to see that I just end up leaving this all plain. Because um, I added the gold to the cable knit one and I didn't want them to like look the same. I don't know. I tried to do as much variation as possible in my sets always, but especially the shape series, because I want to show you as many different things that are possible. So with the cable knit, I painted the lines gold. With this sweater knit, I'm going to leave them plain. And you can see how gorgeous the monochrome look is. I mean, y'all, so good. So good. <laughs> Love. Okay, now I just have to paint the toppers. And yeah, when you're painting with luster dust, um, you have to use a super high alcohol content, clear alcohol, because it evaporates as you are painting and that's how it dries. Um, you cannot use a vodka that has a really low alcohol content, that won't work. So I usually use I use Everclear or I use the Sugar Arts Color Solution, which is a great alternative if you can't access Everclear. Next up, we have the dark green. I love this dark green. It's exactly what I was hoping for, this beautiful like dark forest green. It definitely has some extra blue on it, so it's on the bluer end. And this is my first time using embossed parchment paper. How cool is this? Oh my god. <laughs> um, I'll link the shop that I purchased this from in the description. Now I went with a haul no, sorry, I always get these confused. Mistletoe, not Holly, mistletoe for the print, and then I was made what I think is a cute cheeky choice, <laughs> and I put Holly on top of the mistletoe. Yeah, I don't know. That was cute. Anyway, um, <laughs> so a couple tips about using embossed parchment paper slash just like any parchment paper technique. Um, when you put it on, you want to do what I did, which is where you go from like one side to the other. So you kind of roll it on. And that's the best way to prevent air bubbles. I personally think it's not the end of the world if you get air bubbles. It's just like the aesthetic. But if you're going for imperfect texture, embossedness, <laughs> then um, yeah, roll it from one side to the other. I have always let mine completely dry. I think some people take them off sooner, but I just, if you take them off too soon, um, it's going to look terrible and there's no going back from that. <laughs> so um, I let mine dry completely like six to eight hours. So I did these first on my decorating day. Um, I did them first thing in the morning and then I let them sit out and dry while I was decorating everything else. And because I did so many cookies this day, it was a very long decorating day. And so by the time I was done with everything else, um, and I was ready to move on to these, they were dry and I peeled them off. So yay. I do believe you can use these embossed parchment papers multiple times, depending on, um, you know, the color of the icing. Sometimes I think if it's really dark, it'll kind of color the paper a little bit, but it's a nice effect. Oh, and make sure um, that you don't put too much icing down. And I still have not perfected <laughs> how much pressure to apply so that you get like the best kind of edge to it. Because if you don't press hard enough, then you're going to still have some of the like smooth um, flood on the edge, if that makes sense. This was perfect. I was so proud of myself. I put just the right amount of pressure, covered the whole thing. Um, if you give give too much pressure, then you create like a lip of really thin, sharp icing, which is not ideal either. So it does take some getting used to. Um, I did try a couple other ones, which my application was not that great. 
So those went in the dud corner. <laughs> um, and I only made, again, one of everything. So I think I did how many shapes did I make? Six different shapes? I think I have six different shapes. So I did six different embossed papers and I think I ended up with three. <gasps> it's so cute. Um, just very proud of myself. Oh my goodness gracious. <laughs> oh, wow. This is the moment that I realize I've been doing way too many voiceovers at different points of this set and... <laughs> I'm so sorry. Back when we were doing the sweater technique, you were probably like, Grace, I don't know what you're talking about. We've already done the cable. Like, whoops. <laughs> I don't... What color do we start with? Did we start with blue? I am... I'm losing it. Anyway, yeah. Um... <laughs> <laughs> we did not do this cable knit yet and this is the cable knit I'm trying to figure out oh we started with red so we've only done red and pink wow okay now we're on to green and now we are doing <laughs> the cable knit okay so a couple tips to get the best cable knit possible so number one is your consistency you need to be using a medium peak okay because you want it to hold its shape. If it's more like a soft peak, it's going to kind of melt um, and not look good. All that hard work, you don't want that to go to waste. So medium peak, um, you want to cut the tip of your bag pretty big. So you can see here, what I'm using here is like somewhere between a regular um, outline piping and a flood. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure what it would be but <laughs> you can always experiment you can always go bigger but definitely recommend a pretty big tip so that you can get like a thick piping out of this because I'm this is just how it comes out of the bag I'm not applying like a ridiculous amount of pressure to get it that thick <clears throat> and I excuse me <clears throat> I personally find like I like to have a nice thick cable knit um what else so the movement is obviously the hardest part here, right? So it's kind of this elongated S sort of, and you want to make sure at the end you're really tapering it off so that it's easier to cover it when you come through with the other side. And then you kind of tuck the beginning of the line into the curve of the previous one. Um, I would say probably the first curve is the hardest one to start. And, um, yeah, so we're going to see that again in a minute. These lines here are actually my soft peak piping consistency because I like to do lines with a soft peak. And obviously this has a much smaller tip to it. So two different bags of icing, two different consistencies. I'm doing my little trick with my, um, scribe to kind of create that waterfall falling off the edge effect. Um, you do need to do that while the icing is still wet. If it's already crusted, it's going to look real messy and not good. All right. So you can see I'm tucking the beginning of the next line and then I'm like tapering off when I finish it. It's so satisfying to do. I definitely like the first time I did this wrapping my head around that first curve was really hard. So I tend to do the first curve as just kind of like a half moon shape, not like the full kind of S. So that might be helpful to know. There we go. Wow. I'm so <laughs> I am just losing my marbles. All right. Um, so this one, we are going to paint the lines, and that's what I meant when we were back on the sweater technique. You're, I'm sure you were just like, Grace, we haven't done that yet. What are you talking about? <sighs> this is what happens <laughs> when I'm like, yeah. I, I Obviously, I'm doing this in multiple sittings because this is very long, and it's just trying to get my, my voice and my energy fresh for each segment. So anyway, um, all right, we're doing the topper here. I love this shape. It's probably my second favorite shape from the set. I love the double bubble <laughs> gourd situation, uh, but this would be my second favorite. It's 
very elegant, which I like. Love. So let that line work dry. And then I'm going in painting. I'm using a pretty small brush here. And the hardest part I think about painting gold is first of all, getting the right ratios of the powder to the liquid. And I do not have anything exact. I'm always just testing it out, like add a little bit more one, the other, test it out. Um, and then you don't want to get too much on, on your brush. Um, if you get too much, it very easily just puddles over the edge and then you cry because it's really hard to remove like unintentional gold. Now, the reason I did this one line at a time, because I'm applying this at an angle and I found that the lines were so close to the, uh, the raised cable knit that if I did the line closest, if this makes any sense, like, um, what am I trying to say? Yeah, I would just get gold on the cable knit is what I mean. I don't, hopefully that makes sense. Okay. <laughs> Something like that. Um, yeah, so this was a case, again, if you ever see me moving the cookie, that's because it really needed to be moved for optimal execution. Um, sometimes, like, I try to move my cookie as little as possible for the filming aesthetic because it's more pleasant to the eye the less it moves. That's why you see me use a cookie swivel very rarely. If I break out the cookie swivel, <laughs> it's because I needed it. Generally, though, I recommend, you know, always move the cookie to the optimal angle because everyone has a preferred angle for piping like most, um, most detail piping is at like a 45 degree angle. Um, when I'm flooding here, I'm closer to a 90 degree. I think actually when I'm not filming, I'm really at a 90 degree, but when you're at a 90 degree, you like cover more of the cookie. So I try to make it at an angle. Uh, what else was I going to say on that one? Yeah, I lost some train of thought. Um, <laughs> so everything's always going to be easier to pipe at a certain angle. So just keep that in mind. Right, so I wanted to show you this one from the beginning. This is wet on wet and I'm working pretty fast here. Um, this is one of my favorite ways to do a wet on wet tree. Did not come up with this. Really simple. You could just leave the tree as a zigzag, but I feel like giving the pull up the top just gives it more of a sense of a trunk. Doing a little bit of layering here. I honestly didn't know how I was going to finish this. So I did that first and I was like, uh, it's kind of like floating trees. It needs something. So then I thought to add some little dots for snow, obviously. And <laughs> at this point I look at it and I go, okay, it still needs something. <laughs> and I literally, what well, you don't see off camera because I obviously edited it out. I ran to my <laughs> sprinkle supply and I grabbed my other favorite um, always on hand sprinkles, which is white non-prize. I always have sanding, white sanding sugar and white non-prize. I like to have sanding sugar in two sizes, in the small and the large. And then these white non-prize in the small size. And I just decided to like really roll with the <laughs> snowing snow globe aesthetic. And I think it worked. So you can see here kind of in how it dried that I was applying those non-prize when it was kind of already started to crust because I was flying by the seat of my pants here. Ugh. And I made the mistake of trying to press some of them in very lightly, but you can see that I kind of like cracked the surface a little bit on that left side. Uh, so don't do that. <laughs> But I was afraid that the non-prize were going to fall out if I didn't do that. So, yeah. Let's 
Oh, that this topper is one of my two favorites from this set, kind of giving me this snowy vibes. And also I just wanted to be able to show you that you can totally paint on top of um, sanding sugar, which I'm going to show you another example later, but there we go. That's like the snowy snow globe vibe situation. All right. We're doing another double bubble or, or gourd, whatever you want to call it. And this one, I was really channeling my simple simple wet on wet mesmerized by myself <laughs> so just working quickly here i've got that small bag of icing my lines are not super straight good enough well, let's see what am i doing okay so i am <sighs> doing individual pulls and I'm cleaning my scribe off after every pull. Now this technique, you need to work like extra fast and you need to make sure you have nice thin icing um, because it takes you longer to do this. And every pull in and out of that icing just manipulates the icing more. So if your icing has started to crust at all, uh, it's not going to look good. It's going to have like wrinkles in it and you're going to be sad. <laughs> So do yourself a favor. So pretty. I kind of wish that I had added like white to this in hindsight, but I really leaned into just the two different greens, which is fine. It's still pretty, obviously. <laughs> uh, I just cracked myself up. This is one of those that like I look at it and it's cool and I think to people who don't know how to make these cookies like oh my god it's so like it has a big wow factor this kind of wet on wet but when I look at it I'm like this was so easy this was so simple it's too simple like I look at it and I kind of look down upon it because I'm like it's not it's not hard enough it's not challenging enough um but I have to learn to appreciate this kind of thing more that's <laughs> what I'm trying to say basically uh. all right so just using my scribe to kind of settle that out nice and flat and I'm pretty sure that I'm going to do a slightly different scribe technique on this bottom if I remember it correctly yeah I really do think that like some white could have really popped nicely but I only made one, so ship tailed. All right, so when you do this continuous move, first of all, it looks cool, obviously. But um, second of all, it's a good thing to do if you want to work faster and like your icing is crusting faster or whatever. It's on the thicker side. And then I felt like it needed some dots. I wasn't planning on doing the dots, but I felt like it tied in with the top better. So there you go. <laughs> oh man, I just make myself laugh. It's all good. It's all good. All right. We're going to add the twafa. I like this one. Where I'm just kind of bringing it down using the tip of my bag, since this is a soft peak, to kind of help it settle. And then pulling it up. And painting it when it's dry. On those little tips, uh, gotta make sure, again, you're not using too much um, gold. Now, nine times out of ten when I paint gold, um, I only do one, one go on video that's good enough. And then I always nine times out of 10, uh, off camera, I will, I will give it a second coat and, or I'll, I'll get all the little corners that I miss. But like, 
on camera that doesn't really matter because you just do like the top surface and it's fine it's good enough um but yeah i want to make sure i'm getting all the sides of the icing too not just the top all right moving on to this ombre effect so my inspiration here was um what was my inspiration right okay wow I think I'm gonna need a break soon. <laughs> okay, um, my inspiration was uh, these cookie ornaments that I've seen that use um, an airbrush on white icing that's covered in sanding sugar and they create this beautiful ombre effect. And that is one rare instance where I'm like, I wish I had an airbrush, but I don't have an airbrush. So I wanted to recreate this just with icing. So the way that I did that was I did the, uh, the ombre in the, in the icing because when you use the airbrush you can just flood the whole thing white cover it in white sanding sugar and then do the the ombre but i don't have that again so this is how i decided to do the ombre um you can see that i switched the scribes because the first one i was using was really small and i wanted something with a larger tip to kind of manipulate the icing more so that's what i'm doing here woot 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 And I'm really just trying to mess with this as much as possible. I honestly, this is the first time I've ever done this. So I was not really sure like how this was going to go. Said my prayers. <laughs> oh. And then cover this in sanding sugar. Make sure that you're not using too much icing. I do think I used a little too much. Um, you can get away with slightly under flooding, like not too much though, because if you do too much in there, like indentations in the flood, um, the, I, the sanding sugar will show that. So just keep that in mind. All right. So one of my biggest hacks when covering something completely in sanding sugar, other than making sure that you don't do use too much icing, is then I like to use this tool um, to immediately kind of smooth at, or, or, or um, reinforce the shape of the cookie while it's still wet. So if you already find way too much overflood at this point, you could actually scrape off the overflood and... Um, recover the exposed icing with sanding sugar i have done that many a time um but this is good enough so like as long as the icing is still wet you can continue to kind of um help it in and i find i feel like i could be imagining this that when i use my dehydrator on something like this it just like heats up the icing and makes it flood over more when it's covered in sanding sugar, I don't know. Another thing I've noticed is that when I cover something in sanding sugar, it doesn't dry completely like exposed icing does. Um, so sometimes I do leave these out a little bit longer before I package them just to make sure they're like hard enough. But I will say the ones covered in sanding sugar are absolutely my most favorite ones to eat. Alrighty, next up, we are rocking the light green, which is probably my favorite color from this set. <laughs> um, I'm just completely obsessed with the light green minty goodness. So you can see here, I'm using the embossed paper again, this time a really pretty snowflake design. And I'm doing my best <laughs> to kind of press it out evenly. I do think that I gave a little too much pressure. We'll see when this comes out. So you can see I have like a little bit of a lip, especially at the bottom there, it's a little uneven, which is fine. So I was like, oh my God, what do I do? Also, big air bubble at the top, y'all, whatever. <laughs> um, you just kind of have to own it, I think, because it's just part of the, I don't know. Um, I didn't notice that there was an air bubble and anyway, all right, um, so. I did that and I had no idea how I was going to finish after I did the parchment paper, had no idea. So thankfully, um, I had this brilliant idea to add um, 
this brush embroidery to the edge because I was thinking to myself like I didn't love the border I didn't want to just leave it exposed kind of on its own like I did with the the star and the mistletoe so here I am um what am I doing <laughs> sorry <laughs> brush embroidery so this is actually one of the first techniques I ever learned from Sweet Ams. Um, yeah, she's to me, she's the queen of filigree, brush embroidery, and beaded borders. <laughs> Those are the things I learned from her. Still not that great at filigree though, um, but brush embroidery. So my personal opinion is that you need to use a medium peak for brush embroidery, um, a soft peak is fine but you'll have less texture in the the paintbrush pulls so that maybe i guess is personal preference um i like to have a lot of texture in mind so the next thing you have to decide is what kind of brush do you want to use now i'm here using um a kind of small angled brush because i like to come at my icing <laughs> with like a narrow brush um you want to use something that's pretty stiff so I wouldn't do just like um something that narrow that's just like straight if that makes sense like this is wide and flat and angled um this is probably my favorite brush to use for this small area now if I was doing bigger um areas of brush embroidery I have used like a flat but more narrow brush um so i'm pulling like more width at a time if that makes sense because the smaller your brush the longer it takes right because you have to cover more surface area with those tiny little pulls um the next thing is kind of how thick you make your line i don't understand how people do just like a normal thick pipe normal thickness piped line and get a beautiful <laughs> brush embroidery out of it I don't get it um so I always end up applying a little bit more pressure like you can see here I'm not piping like a normal line like I'm applying more pressure so I get more icing out the next key is you want to be pulling from the center of the line down. Um, if you pull too far, then you get rid of the nice um, outer edge of that line and it just becomes this like brush pull situation, if that makes sense. Um, so that's another reason why I like to do a slightly thicker line because I just have more icing to work with. Um, and if you don't pull enough icing, then you're not going to get as much of an effect, right? So in this case, this is pretty low stakes, <laughs> um, brush embroidery. Often I'll do this as like a scalloped border, um, before flooding a cookie. So in that case, you have to be really make sure that you're pulling enough icing down and that you have enough icing to work with so that you get, um, so that the icing covers enough of the surface. Now, I think typically um, brush embroidery is, is used with white to mimic lace, which is beautiful. Um, and you can't tell obviously here because it's the same color, but what's nice about this brush embroidery is that it it's very a very thin layer, so you can still see the icing underneath, if that makes sense. So um, we're doing, what are we doing here? We're doing, <laughs> we're doing a splatter. Um, this is my not messy way to do a splatter, but it gives you much more uneven and thicker splatters. It's just a different effect. Um, if you watch my other videos, another way to do it is to use a paintbrush, sorry, paintbrush, a toothbrush. Um, but you need to use a glove with that, or you can still use a paintbrush and use a glove and actually use your thumb um, to kind of brush the bristles that probably doesn't make any sense <laughs> but oh well um I just I don't know I, I don't like to get messy <laughs> and I also for that one especially because the snowflakes were different sizes 
I just like the idea of having uneven splatter. The other way of doing the, the toothbrush or like the thumb technique um, gives you a much smaller but more even splatter. So just keep that in mind. Now here's another one that I'm covering in sanding sugar, but this time I did small sanding sugar because again, remember shape series set, I like to show you as many different techniques as possible. So this has a different look to it and I wanted you to see that. Now I did add a bit too much icing to my flood, which I soon learned because it was definitely falling over the edge immediately. But going in with my thingamajini tool, literally it's called a thingamajini by the cookie countess, um, favorite tool, so useful. And we're gonna let that dry. You can see it spread a little bit more, whatever. Oh, well, um, you're gonna see me cut out some of the topper stuff as we go on because y'all this video is long. <laughs> okay, so I covered that in sanding sugar and I had no idea how I was gonna finish it. I really, I looked at it and I was like, I don't know what to do. And it was giving me like snowy vibes. So I thought, why don't we put some snowflakes on it? I don't know. Seems cute. So that's what I proceeded to do. And honestly, I'm obsessed. This is also one of my favorites. I have so many favorites from this set, so I can't really <laughs> maybe calling it another favorite is just like losing its power, but whatever. Um, so I'm doing them evenly because that's how my brain works. Um, even spacing for the most part that I guess that one wasn't so even. Um, I'm using my soft peak by pink consistency. You don't, if you're doing something like this, you don't want to use icing that's too thick because then it won't adhere to the sprinkles. You need to use something that's soft enough. That's going to kind of melt a little bit into the, the sprinkles, if that makes sense. So now I'm just going to like the key to doing this kind of spacing is to make sure you get the outer edges, even if you're just going to do a partial design so that's really in my opinion what makes this look really good v proud of myself <laughs> the uh it's just like sparkly snowy softness with that beautiful mint green um i skipped painting the topper because y'all we've been moving on okay this is also one of my favorites but i have to be honest i was going to start the um the compilation video with this cookie because this is one of my favorites it's the center of the main photo um but i just found that it just i always i love how the sanding sugar looks in the end but i don't think it's very satisfying to watch especially since i'm obviously changing the um focus on the cookie not ideal also my flood of this was not great which you didn't get to see <laughs> because I skipped that here but I love the simplicity obviously I love the color we've talked about that and I do this little holly motif a few different times and oh, I love adding the sanding sugar to the holly berries that's a common thing too with um uh cranberry accents so good all right we have another mint green deliciousness uh this shape I don't know I call this the geometric shape is that a great name for it? I don't know. It's pretty boring, but <laughs> it does the trick, right? Um, yeah. All right. This is another fly by the seat of my pants moment. Um, I, I just kept adding more and adding more and I don't, I don't know. You can tell me at the end <laughs> what you think about it. All right. This is a pretty big cookie. I feel like this was like four and a half inches maybe. So I had this cute, adorable idea, right, to do this wet on wet holly. And the second I started piping it, I was like, oh, no. Because it just looks like blobs. <laughs> but I only made one of these and I just had to roll with the punches. And so, because like, y'all, it just looks like green blobs. Um, to prevent that, I would have needed a much, much smaller tip on my bag to get more definition. So I looked at this and I was like, all right, pivot, what do we do? So I took my scribe to attempt to create a little bit more definition, 
a little more holly action. And I was like, okay, it's getting better, but now we've got like green croissants. <laughs> you know? I don't know. Like, what is this? Oh, man. Yeah, not my finest hour, but that's okay. So, but it does not end here, in case you're wondering. Um, oh, right. I needed to add a little bit more in the corner. I am going to add berries in a moment. This was really playing with fire with how much I was trying to do on this icing. Um, because it was a thin flood, but it, it could have been thinner. Let's just say that. So I got to add my berries. And it's like, okay, starting to come together. <laughs> sort of. Um, but it gets a lot more treatment. Just brace your sills. Love it. Remember, we're going to fill all the extra spots. Okay, so now it has crusted and I'm like, not doing it for me yet. So I decide to add some extra dots. I don't know. Um, using a soft peak piping consistency here. Add in those dot, dot, dots. Love it. Okay, and then we're going to let those dots crust Oh, after we do the topper, apparently. I think I left this in because this might be the first time I've done it this way. So this is the scalloped, um, but we're going to use a flood on top of it to give it like a nice, puffy, clean look. Now we're going to let it crust <laughs> and we're going to add gold. Okay. We're starting with the topper. Um, this will be fun to watch it evolve because <laughs> I just kept adding more gold <laughs> thinking it would make it better. I did wonder if I should, should have stopped at the dots. Let's see. Let's see what it looks like after I do the dots. Diddly dots. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. <laughs> All right. Oh, uh, losing it. That's fine. Totally fine. Okay. And then, and then I decided that wasn't enough. That, like, the holly needed just a little bit more definition, um, intentional definition from the green blobs. <laughs> uh, I like it. It's just, it's, it's extra. You know what? It's extra. Sometimes, sometimes you gotta go extra. And I should have, could have, would have used an even smaller brush than I'm using here. But y'all, I already dirtied this one and I just, I don't know, I didn't feel like dirtying another one. So here we are. Yeah, it's a lot of extra. That's okay. It's pretty. I like it. I do like it. I do. Next up, we're rocking the blue. This is the Sugar Art Master Elite in Blueberry. A gorgeous color. Highly recommend, obviously. <laughs> so, um, this is the Double Bubble again. And this is probably the most, like, predictable execution of this design because <clears throat> this is inspired by the vintage concave glass ornaments. I grew up with them because my parents had them and I'm pretty sure they got them from their parents. 
So <laughs> um, I remember a lot of broken ones, to be totally honest. But <clears throat> that's where this inspiration came from. I'm also certainly not the first person to do this, just to be clear here. So to create the concave effect, I started by covering the um, most of the area with the blue, obviously. I used um the flood for that you can also use piping consistency i wanted as little texture as possible which is why i went with the flood <clears throat> sorry i have a frog in my throat okay um it's really important to not go all the way to the edge <laughs> with um anything like this because it just makes flooding over a royal pane in the bumpkins so do yourself a favor. <laughs> Don't flood all the way to the edge. Um, I am trying to prevent trying to prevent craters here, which is why I've done this squiggle. And then I'm going to immediately come in with a flood. I don't know. I was having <laughs> trouble getting that icing out there for a second. This is still all the same thin flood. My oval is a little wonky. Wah, wah. <laughs> if you could find normally if I have something like this I might use like a cookie cutter to actually mark out the shape but I don't know I just didn't even think that I would have something this shape because normally something like this would be like a circle and circles are just a pain um so I would use a cookie cutter to to mark out a circle that I can trace <sighs> I didn't do that this time you know what good enough. <laughs> so I'm doing a wet on wet design here because that's what I felt called to do. Um, I will say, so you have to be a little careful if you're doing wet on wet and you've done squiggles underneath because obviously now you have like extra icing underneath. All the more reason not to let the squiggles dry. Um, but I'm usually extra careful then to just not stick my scribe in too far to the icing because I don't really want to take the squiggle with me if that makes sense um this is cute by itself and honestly I almost wish I left it alone yeah I kind of actually do well whatever um this is a fun little technique um when you do the hearts hearts the the dots far enough away then from each other then they look like hearts which they, which they do here but I've done this um, to make it look like a wreath, but for that you want to put the dots closer together and or make them bigger um, so that they kind of melt together more, if that makes sense. Makes total sense. Okay. <laughs> so I let that crust so I can move on to the next section because I wanted it to be, you know, the flooded in sections effect. And naturally, I had to add a little wet on wet to this bottom section, obviously. Who am I? <laughs> uh, I just love wet on wet so much. It's probably the first technique that I learned. So versatile, so like simple. I wouldn't say it's easy, it's simple. Well, not all of them are simple, but <laughs> some of them can be very simple. Um, but they're just so effective, which is, as you know, if you've followed me for a minute, um, simple and effective are the name of the game to me. Love that. I just, oh man, these colors together. So good. So good. I would not have wanted to put that dark green because it just would have been way too dark against that blue. I would say color wise, the only thing that I wish I had done with this set was to mix the colors more because I feel like I did a lot of monochromatic palettes with a lot of the um, the ornaments. I didn't have any designs that had all the colors in it, which usually when I do a shape series set, I always have at least a couple of designs that have all of the colors. <clears throat> and I don't know, just didn't feel called to do that this time. So I didn't. And we finished that off, let that crest. And then we're moving on to the center concave part and I'm piping lines here with soft peak piping consistency. And this is how I do spacing. I just split the difference over and over again. <clears throat> so this is the moment I realize 
I can't keep going through the center and in a continuous line because there would be too much icing. So you can see I actually start and stop in the center. And so that's to prevent too much of a buildup in the middle, because if you keep layering all of those lines, it's just going to be a lump of icing. And I honestly could have probably started doing that after I did the first cross, <laughs> but I was rolling with the punches. <clears throat> then I decided, whoops, <laughs> to attempt to add a little... Little, little guy in the middle because I just I wasn't planning on it but it just worked and then I had to add some more gold obviously <laughs> someone asked me um why I didn't just make yellow icing to um <clears throat> excuse me to to make these little I don't know lines whatever the <laughs> whatever this is um why did I paint it gold? Because gold paint looks very different from gold icing. Um, it does not have the same effect at all. And it's, well, different reason why I didn't do the toppers in the color. So um, let me clarify. Right here, I'm painting on top of blue. And the reason for that is because... Um, when you're doing fine details on top of a flood, I usually prefer to pipe with the same color as the flood, because then if you don't perfectly cover up the piping on top, then it's less noticeable, right? So now with the toppers, I did all the toppers in white, and that's because there's a much larger surface to cover with that topper than just like these little detail lines. and with this totally edible luster dust, um, it doesn't have the best coverage. I mean, it's good. It's good. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but um, in a larger space like that, it just needs like if I was trying to cover that dark blue, it just it would have been hard. <laughs> so um, in the most ideal world, I probably would have made an, a yellow icing and then painted on top of that. But I didn't do that. All right. This cookie um, totally... I don't know where this came from. I don't know where this idea came from. My head somewhere. Um, this entire cookie <laughs> is brush embroidery. So we've already talked about brush embroidery. Um, this took a long time. By the way, I don't know why. <laughs> I always have to go from right to left. I tried going from left to right. Um, and it just did not work. And then I don't know why I don't just totally go from right to left. So I'm just a continuous... Am I making any sense? <laughs> like continuous brushing across the whole thing? I don't know. Anyway, I digress. Um, <clears throat> see, I'm always going from right to left. Whatever. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I don't know what to say about this because we've already talked about brush embroidery. I will admit I am going to skip some of this because this is a long one. This is like an, I don't know, eight, nine, ten minute cookie. A lot of the cookies in this set are like eight, nine minute cookies, which is long for me. I would say simpler cookies tend to be in the like four to six range. But hashtag worth it. So is this, nope, okay, I'm going to do one more layer, and then I think I'm going to cover this with glitter. Now, this is a great technique if you don't like as much icing, right? I totally could have done this on top of a flooded surface. That is an option, too. But I don't know, I was feeling like not. <laughs> doing that. Um, I feel like there's also a little more dimension with the color um, because it's being painted on top of um, the naked cookie. If it was on top of like a navy flood, then um, I don't know. I don't know if I'm making any sense. Anyway, so <laughs> that edible glitter is the Sugar Art Diamond Dust in, I think it's gold. 
Again, I think I've said that I have both the 10K gold and the regular gold, and I don't know that there's really a difference. I mean, I can see a difference in the bottle, but when I actually put it on the cookies, I don't know that there's much of a difference. I love them both, <laughs> no matter what. Um, so you can see in that upper right corner that I was a little heavy handed with my glitter. And I was like, oh man, when I did it, so annoying because I had such a nice even covering until that one. Um, you can see I do use the the pumps, which gives you much better coverage than if you like tapped it out of the container, which I used to do all the time. All right. Yeah, so now I'm trying to make up for the fact that I, whoops, added too much because I don't want that to like stick out. I think at some point, yeah, now I'm adding a bunch more because I'm trying to even it out. Now it's really gold. I didn't intend to use that much glitter, but I did. Finishing it off with that topper and we're done with that. All right, this one is super simple. I already flooded the cookie and now I'm just going in with a sprinkling of the large sanding sugar. I like the Wilton and um, there's one that I found at Hobby Lobby. I don't actually have a Hobby Lobby. I just found it on the internet and it was super on sale and I love it because it's really shiny. That might be this one. Not entirely sure. Anyway. Um, I was just going for a sprinkling effect here. I didn't want to cover the thing. And then <laughs> because I'm a glutton for splatter, <laughs> I added um, more splatter. Yeah, I don't know. It's like, it's simple. I think it's cool. Probably not everyone's cup of tea, and that's okay. <laughs> not all my designs always make sense, and that's okay. Totally fine. And there we have it. All right, what do we have next? Okay, this one did not come up with this design. I saw it from um, Megan over at Downtown Doto. I don't really know what to call this. Um, other than I'm, I'm obsessed with it. It's not the first time I've done it. Um, so it's just like this pressure pipe improvised situation. So it's a lot of kind of teardrops over and over again. Some of them are straight, some are curved. I just flow with whatever feels right. No two of these cookies are ever the same. I think I actually unfortunately made two of them. Because somehow I think I forgot to film the first one I did, um, which happens every once in a while. So frustrating. I think I pressed film and then somehow I didn't. So this is that same concept of pressure piping as the knit technique where you're piping like a dot. And as you pull away, you release pressure and you pull down towards the cookie. This is definitely harder than it looks. <laughs> um, and yeah, cause you have to also really focus on a nice ending to it. I try to vary the size, the direction, whether it's straight, whether it's curved, all that fun stuff. And I like to do it in this monochromatic look um, you could do a different color piped on top. That would work too. But I'm in love with this one. And I think at some point I'm going to fast forward to the end. Ah, there we go. Okay. So what I like to add as my own touch to this is I like to paint some of them gold. There's really no rhyme or reason. I try to make them like uneven <laughs> um like not always the same number in each cluster that I paint 
and yeah that's it paint the topper and then we're just about done with this cookie <laughs> we still have more video all right what is next okay we've moved on to the white i've skipped ahead here i outlined and i flooded this is a wet flood and i'm immediately moving on to this wreath i am completely obsessed with this wreath technique completely obsessed and I love it on this double bubble gourd situation. Mm, love it so much. I just, y'all, so good. Okay. I like to start, as I said, with the green on the bottom. I did think after I made this, this would also look cool if you did the sections separately, like bottom and then top or whatever. Um, but it also looks super cool as one section. And I have left space on the edge because we're going to be doing a beaded border. Yes, you heard that right. So I swear you can make this so messy and it still turns out great. I mean, look at my zigzags. Like, look how uneven they are. <laughs> oh, but what's important, I think, is just to make sure you're alternating. You see, I'm filling in all of the empty spaces with the top green. And then I take my smallest scribe because this is a pretty small area and I just go around so easy. I mean, like y'all, <laughs> I'm so impressed with myself. I know you're like Grace. All right, whatever. <laughs> oh, and then I add the berries. Love me some berries. And again, I just try to like, change it up three two one two three one one whatever um i do think it helps too to have the lighter green on top because there's a bit more of that which helps the red to pop more because um i think that red against the dark green would be challenging Then we let that crust and we move on to the beaded border. Another one, another technique that I learned from Sweet Ams and I'm positively obsessed with. So this is a medium peak. I've cut the tip a bit bigger because I really want to cover that full edge of the cookie. That's something to keep in mind when you're outlining the initial um, section or the, the flood part is how much cookie you're leaving exposed. Um, this is a pressure pipe technique, just like we've been doing. It's the same concept of the teardrop. You're just doing it over and over again on top of each other. Um, as opposed to the Nick technique, which is like, uh, back and forth, right to left kind of thing. I personally love to cover the entire edge of the cookie with my beaded border. So if I need to cut my tip bigger, I will. I mean, how, how Christmassy is that? Oh, Okay. This is another like snowy vibes one, but you're going to see. <laughs> I was really impatient when I was decorating with this bear technique. I sh absolutely 1000% 1000% should have waited longer. Um, when you're doing the bear technique, you're applying a good amount of pressure, right? With this paintbrush. And it is so easy to poke a hole. <laughs> which I didn't poke a hole, thankfully, but I definitely made an indent. And I don't think I did it yet, but you'll definitely see it when this dries and we move on to the next one. So I realized I used too much icing, which is what I'm trying to like pull off. Because if you have too much icing, you're not really going to get um, texture. I think I made that indent and that's where, because I had too much icing on the end of my brush, which made it really heavy. Um, you can do a, a piping consistency or a flood for this. I used a flood because I wanted very little texture. The thicker the icing, the more texture you're going to get. Love it. Okay, so again, I only made one of these, so I had to roll with the punches with my indent. You're going to see it in a minute if I can just stop doing this bear technique. <laughs> It'll happen and cut come on grace oh no i'm coming back for more <laughs> guess it wasn't enough 
So if it, this is what I'm doing here. If you're not getting quite enough texture because you had too much icing, if you let it dry just like 30 seconds, then you can come back with your brush and um, get more texture with it. So you can see that indent towards the middle. So I was like, great, I'm gonna cover that with my greenery. <laughs> so this is the same um, knit technique that I did on the pink one, the back and forth. This is the moment where I go, oops, I want that to be longer. So I made it a little bit longer. And then I make a point to make this long enough <laughs> to cover that. So now you can't even see it, I swear. As I get better, I just get better at covering up my mistakes. 1000%. Yeah. <laughs> and then had to add some nice big old berries to the top. And then I thought it still needed a little bit more, so I added some berries to the whatever greenery. <laughs> oh man. I love it. It's so pretty. So pretty. Love. Look at that. It's like snowy, wintry, Christmassy vibes because of the berries and the greenery. Okay, this one, also not my design. Um, I first saw this from the Kaleida Cuts ornament cutters. Um, I don't know if she came up with it or whatnot. I mean, I think this, this is actually mimicking an actual vintage ornament. I could be wrong here, but I believe it is. So the key here is to use a soft peak piping consistency to make these dots because you're trying to make them as soft and round as possible and I'm getting the bigger dots just by applying more pressure and getting more icing and then I'm using my scribe right away to help them settle I still don't think I did a great job <laughs> getting my dots to totally settle like I could have done a better job but YOLO um I'm patient but I'm not that patient Fortunately, unfortunately. Um, I also was like really excited about this color combo, but after I did it, <laughs> and you'll see at the end, these dots literally look like blueberries, which is obviously ironic because the name of the color is blueberry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. This is another part of the design that everyone's doing is adding lines in between the dots. And I'm curving mine just a little bit so that... Um, it kind of goes with the curve of the cookie to kind of mimic um, the roundness. And I'm doing three because I really like the look of three, but it's tight here to do three. So you could do two and make it easier on yourself. This part was torture. Um, do it, You can't tell, but doing it at this angle, mm, not easy. <laughs> if you're decorating this, please turn your cookie. But I did not want to have to. You can see how slowly I'm moving because I'm really like I'm I'm moving over a bunch of blind spots as I'm doing this, which is super frustrating. At the end, I am going to paint these lines, I think. Yeah, I do. OK. All right. We're skipping ahead a little bit. Um, this is the hardest part. So in the Kaleida Cuts design, there's actual in like scalloped indentations on the edge of the cookie to actually carry these dots, but this is just a circle. <laughs> so the, if the effect here is you literally want it on the side of the icing because you want them to stick out, this is hard. Um, but as long as you're using the right consistency, it's not going to fall off or fall over or whatever. This next part is the most epic torture. <laughs> um, you're going to see here, I'm trying to do this. Oh, it's just so bad because of the ankle. I really should have moved the cookie. I actually made this cookie again because I was so unhappy <laughs> with my lines and this blob here. So a handful of the cookies I made twice for different reasons. Um, really just a handful though, like maybe three or four. Um, I didn't intend to make them twice, but I felt like I needed to redo them or like that other one where I forgot to film it. 
Whoopsie doodle. All right, so in a moment after we get these dots finished, we are going to move on to painting. I think I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. Yep, so same deal with that other one. I did the left side dot lines first, then I flipped the cookie, and now I'm doing the opposite, the remaining lines just to maximize the painting angle so I don't have to worry about painting any of those blue dots. So by all means, stare into those dots a little more, especially since I didn't do the best job finishing them at the top. It really does look like a little blueberry opening. Yee! <laughs> Whatever. I love the dots on the edge. <clears throat> so good. All right, so moving on. I already flooded this. This is freshly flooded, still wet. Immediately moving on to doing the sanding sugar. We've seen the sanding sugar before. This is the big size, but we're going to do something a little different with this one. So first I need to make sure I have covered the cookie well. There was a bit of a clump in here. Um, maybe, actually I don't know why that happened. So I'm going to dig it out very carefully and then cover that with sanding sugar again. Now, if you watch the sped up version of this, I took this part out because I want the illusion that I did it perfectly, okay? Um, but in the tutorials here, I like to leave it in so you can see how I fix my mistakes. So we're gonna come in with a thingamajini again, of course, just to finesse all of the edges to make sure they're good. And then we're gonna do the topper. We're gonna to let this crust. And we're gonna come in for the best part. Oh, yay. All right, topper. This has crusted, by the way. And we're just gonna paint the whole thing. Um, this is, this looks stupid simple. You're like, Grace, why are you even doing this? Um, because I wanna show you what's possible. And this is a really easy, like, I think impressive thing to do. One thing I wish I had done um, was actually add some edible glitter on top of this <laughs> just for like maximum sparkle because um, obviously when you paint the sanding sugar it loses like the sparkle because you paint it over it. It's still pretty. Don't get me wrong. And this was me being lazy and not getting out the smaller brush. <laughs> but that's okay. Um... I would not recommend painting that topper though with that size brush. All right, moving on. We've got another embossed parchment paper. This is a different um, snowflake design that's much more fine. And I really like it for that reason. And since I did it on white, it was giving total snowy vibes. Now, I did all of these embossed par parchment papers and I didn't know how I was gonna finish any of them. <laughs> I just thought I would fly by the seat of my pants. And I had this idea to add some of the snowy draping on this because it was giving me snowy vibes. And I love that. So pretty. So I'm outlining it first with the soft peak. And then I'm coming in with the flood. And again, I don't want to put too much flood. Because uh, we're going to cover this in sanding sugar. And I don't want it to flood all the way over the edge. Now, when I do this kind of drip thing, when I'm doing like a one consistency outline in flood, I would totally just use the thick flood to do this because it would it would not fall off the cookie. But a thin flood probably would. And I don't want to risk that. I love the sanding sugar on this off-white. Oh, speaking of the off-white. So the way to achieve 
I think I have found the perfect way to achieve an off-white that goes with the color of your set. I added the tiniest bit of all of my colors to white icing. I wish I had taken a picture because I want to say like not even a pea size. I mean, also obviously depends on how much icing you're mixing, but a very small amount. A very small amount. Yeah, I mean, I think less than a pea size. And that gets an off-white and it gets all of the same like undertones, qualities, whatever the correct words are um, of the colors in the set. Because I tried making a color from scratch for the off-white and it just, I was like, is it too warm? Is it too cold? I couldn't figure out what it was that just was not working. And then I decided to do this and I'm so proud of myself. Okay. We bring back the wreath. I literally just made this cookie because I wanted to make more wreaths. And I was like, how many different ways can I do this? So I'm just alternating the directions for a little more variety. Variety. I don't know why I said that so strangely. And we're going to come in hot with the berries. Now I also did this on a pink background. I definitely think I like it best on the off-white. It pops the most. It just looks so pretty with the greens and the red. Clearly I'm very proud of myself. <laughs> As I should be, right? Now I do believe I skipped past doing the topper, but we're doing the same snowy topper that I did on a different cookie. Love that look. Love painting it gold even more. I mean, all right, this next one gives me my off-white monochromatic vibes, heart, happy. <laughs> I don't think that was a proper sentence, but that's okay. Um, we let the base crust and then we just go in with lines, faux days, faux days. Um, I started in the middle because that just made sense to me. I honestly... Sometimes I kind of wish I started at the bottom just because I realized as I was piping this that like spacing wise, it was easiest for me to go up. And after this, I'm going to have to go down. Um, yeah, that's just my sidebar. But I would have worried about not making the line straight. And what counts as straight here, I think, is really making sure that that center line matches up with the two corners. So that's why, that, that's why I started there. Again, this little um, scribe thing that I'm doing, super important to do while the lines are still wet. So that's why I do it in um, batches because if I waited the in, for the entire cookie um, to be done, they would have crusted and it just like, it does not make a nice clean end of your line. So just keep that in mind. Um, I think we're gonna skip ahead here. Straight lines, brace your elbow on the table or your arm on the table somewhere. Um, brace your piping hand if you need to. Lift your bag off the surface of the cookie. Always be guiding your icing. So the shorter the line, the less I lift the bag off, but I'm still lifting the bag off. The line looks drastically different if you don't. Okay. Okay, just nod. Say yes, Grace. <laughs> so I wasn't planning on paint. No, I can't. Mm. Okay, I lied. I, I was going to say I wasn't planning on painting this, but I think I was planning on painting all of the lines gold, but I ultimately decided to kind of do it somewhat randomly instead of painting all of them gold. So got to do a little choppy choppy here. I do think this is better or this is easier with this really small scribe than if you use something with a larger tip because you're doing a really fine movement here. Gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. So just carefully painting 
um, you can add, so if you don't add enough luster dust to your mixture, it will be really transparent and it won't cover well enough. If you add too much, it kind of becomes cakey um, and like has a texture to it, which you don't want. You want it to like paint on nice and smoothly. All right. It has happened, my friends. We're on to the last cookie. Now, <laughs> at this point, I just feel like I can't do a shape series without doing this <laughs> technique. I don't know. <laughs> just just how it happens. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm just uncomfortable with myself. Okay. Um, also, I always imagined this going on an ornament and it's perfect. So I decided to roll with um, the white look, obviously, and I'm going to add edible glitter. So you do want to add this in stages because the icing will start to crust and the edible glitter is deceiving because you can put it on top of crusted icing and it'll look like it has adhered. But if you run your finger across it, it will come off on your finger. <laughs> um, every time I use edible glitter, it gets everywhere and my roommate walks in and she's like, it's a glitter cloud. <laughs> yeah. This is an offset spatula, by the way, the small size. But you can totally use um, a kitchen knife as long as it has a rounded end to it. This offset spatula does kind of spread out the dots a little bit. So you need to give them a little space in between each other. Um, and I'm using a medium peak here. I do think that's important for this technique. I've done it with a soft peak and it's okay. It doesn't totally melt, but I just like to have a bit more definition in my pulls. And you want to make sure you're pulling far enough. Um, you're pulling like at a tapered angle toward the cookie. Uh, you want to make sure you pull far enough so that the next row of dots um, co covers the icing before it, if that makes sense. Isn't she beautiful? <laughs> and I think we're actually going to do the whole topper for this. Finish off strong. Again, this like this would look so pretty with the white diamond diamond dust. Nine times out of ten, I use the white diamond. That's the edible glitter. Um, doesn't matter what color it is. I use white. But since all of my accents were gold for this, I just thought I would rock, rock the gold glitter because I so rarely ever use it. It looks so pretty. Mm. I love it so much. We're just finishing this off and then we're going to come to an end so soon. Can you believe it? Oh my goodness. Wow. That was a marathon. That was a feat, but we did it. We got through it together. <laughs> As always, I hope you learned more than a thing or two this time around. Maybe you'll even try some yourself this Christmas, next Christmas. Just like to provide a little inspiration, a little fun. It was a pleasure as always. And I hope you have a sweet, sweet day. <laughs> All right. Bye for now.